In the year 1260, the Mongols were at the height of their power and poised to swallow up the very heart of Islamic civilization. At this moment, a Mongol army swept into Syria, ready to crush the forces of the Mamluk Sultan Qutuz. In defiance, the Mamluk Sultan assembled his army and prepared for the showdown that would determine the very future of Islam, the Battle of Ain Jalut. Here, the Mamluks and the Mongols would decisively test one another in one of the truly remarkable battles of the Middle Ages. Twelve sixty, three decades after the death of Genghis Khan, the Mongols are one of the world's most formidable powers. With their swift mounted archers and immense armies, they have defeated virtually all forces in their path. Monke Khan, grandson of Genghis, tasked his brother Hulagu with subduing his empire's western enemies. By the middle of the 13th century, the Mongols had made serious gains at the expense of the Islamic world. In 1258, Hulagu annihilated Baghdad, the seat of the Abbasid Caliphs. He next entered Syria and subdued Aleppo and Damascus. Now, he had only to break the Mamluks who ruled Egypt. He dispatched a messenger to Qutuz, Sultan of Egypt, with the message, We have conquered vast areas, massacring all the people. Fortresses will not detain us, nor armies stop us. Qutuz responded by beheading the Mongol envoys and displaying their heads on the gates of Cairo. But the death of Monke prevented Hulagu from responding immediately. Hulagu departed the Levant for Mongolia to join in the political wrangling that always followed the death of the Great Khan. Meanwhile, Qutuz took the opportunity to overrun Mongol holdings in Syria. But the Mongols did finally respond. Hulagu's lieutenant, Kitbuka, received intelligence that Qutuz's army outnumbered his own by at least two to one. Nevertheless, Kitbuka decided to move out against the Mamluks. Leading an army of some 20,000 men, Kitbuka crossed the Jordan River and entered the Valley of Ain Jalut, which, according to tradition, was the site of the battle between David and Goliath. The battle took place on September 3rd, 1260. Aside from their numerical advantage, the Mamluks knew the territory better. Qutuz concealed a large portion of his army in the hill country. While he dispatched an advance force under the commander Baibars to skirmish with the Mongols and try to lure them into a trap. At first, exchanges were limited to hit-and-run tactics, with mounted archers from both sides hammering one another with waves of arrows. This fighting went on for some time, with neither side gaining a clear advantage. At last, the Mongols launched a heavy assault. This was exactly what Baibars wanted. Baibars responded by executing a feigned retreat designed to draw the Mongols into pursuing his cavalry. The Mongols took the bait. Baibars broke for the hills, drawing the Mongol forces after him. At last, Baibars had his enemies where he wanted them. Suddenly, the rest of Qutuz's forces emerged. All at once, the Mongols found themselves surrounded facing the full force of the Mamluk army. Despite this disastrous situation, the Mongols fought fiercely to break out from the encirclement. Kitbuka's vanguard advanced to take on the main Mamluk body, while the Mongols' second line wheeled right to overwhelm the Mamluk's left wing. From a distance, Qutuz observed the battle with his personal force. When he saw the Mongols overwhelming his left wing, the Sultan threw off his helmet so that all his men could see his face. Oh my Islam, he cried out. He sent his right wing to support his crumbling left wing. For hours, the Sultan struggled to regain his left side. Eventually, the Mongols were repulsed and the Mamluks' left side was restored. Qutuz dispatched his reserves to his far wings to bolster his position at these vulnerable points. Outnumbered, exhausted, the position of the Mongols was now critical. Taking the lead with his personal bodyguard, Qutuz launched the final general assault. The Mongols fought with much spirit, but they were overwhelmed by the sheer superiority of the Mamluks' numbers. While his main force pushed the Mongols back, the Mamluk right and left swept in to flank the Mongols on either side. At this critical moment, Kitbuka died, and the Mongols now broke and fled. In total, 
Mongol casualties numbered between five and 10,000 men. It was a resounding victory for Katuz, Baibars, and the Mamluks. The Mamluk victory at Ain Jalut was the result of Katuz's superior numbers and his effective use of terrain. Baibars played a critical role in drawing the Mongol army into a deadly trap. Ain Jalut also cemented the Mamluks as the leading Muslim power of the era. After the Abbasids were swept aside by the Mongols, the Mamluks successfully halted Mongol expansion. Thus, the Mamluks emerged as the defenders of Islam. Meanwhile, internal strife within the Mongol Empire prevented the Mongols from responding to their humiliation at Ain Jalut. Indeed, it was the succession crisis in Mongolia that had drawn Hulagu away in the first place and left Kitbuga with inadequate forces to finish the conquest of Syria and Egypt. Within five years, civil war would hopelessly fracture the enormous Mongol Empire. Only a month after his great victory at Ain Jalut, Katuz was killed by the dagger of an assassin during a hunting expedition. At the time, many suspected Baibars was involved, and this suspicion continues to this day. No doubt Baibars benefited more than anyone else from Katuz's death, for he became Sultan of Egypt in October of 1260, thus crowning an already brilliant military career. Check out my second YouTube channel, Roman Lion. Also, check out my novel about the Crusades, Why Does the Heathen Rage? Both are linked in the description down below.